I'm Dave Prouse. In this lesson, I'll discuss key stretching and demonstrate how key stretching and salting work as related to passwords using PBKDF2. Key stretching makes a potentially weak key stronger and more secure. It's also known as key strengthening. The original weaker key is fed into an algorithm, producing an enhanced or stretched key. This is a way of securing a low entropy key, which is done in part by increasing the iteration count. Brute force password cracking and rainbow attacks become more difficult because an attacker must compute the stretching function for every guess of the enhanced key. Because it's still crackable, 128-bit keys or higher are recommended, at least as of the recording of this video, but we have to remember the purpose, which is to increase computational time, thereby raising the cost of the key searching machine to the point where it becomes too expensive for the attacker to build. But you have to balance it. You still want to retain usability in your system. So there's some food for thought right there. Now, a couple methods used to perform key stretching include hashing, which is used in a timed loop, or block ciphering. In the more common instance of hashing, the timed loop means the amount of iterations of the hash. This could be a thousand or it could be a million, depending on your technology situation, your technology's limitations, and also based on Moore's law, which will effectively double whatever that number is every 18 to 24 months. Here's a basic description of key stretching. The original key was uh, originally referred to as S bits. And back in the day when key stretching was first developed, you might have had a 40 bit key and that might not have been considered uh, strong enough. So we would add a key stretching element, which would be known as T bits. And so we might add an additional 16 bits to that 40 bit key and that would stretch it and it would give us an enhanced key S plus T, which would be a 56 bit key. Now today you might have a 64 bit key, which is not considered strong enough. Uh, for example, it might be a WEP key or something else, uh, 64 bit. And we might stretch that with 16 bits to make it an 80 bit key, or we might go as far as to stretch it another 64 bit, giving us that 128 bit key. And like we said, 128 bit keys or higher are recommended. Now, additional input in the form of a salt is often used in conjunction with key stretching in order to defend against dictionary attacks. Now, I'll talk more about salting as we move on and show a demonstration as well. So we'll get back to that in a minute, but that's, you know, usually goes hand in hand with key stretching. Examples of key stretching in applications include PGP, now via Symantec, also GPG, OpenSSH, Cisco IOS, WinZip, and Apache, for example, the .ht password file, and so on. Examples of algorithms that use it include PBKDF2, which is very common, Bcrypt, Script, and Argon2, which as of July 2015 is considered an improved key stretching standard. Now, you could create your own scheme, your own algorithm, but it's recommended to use one of the tested algorithms out there just because so many people have contributed to it and it's, they've gotten better and better over time. Weaknesses include weak hashes, for example, SHA-1, which you know we're pretty much avoiding altogether. Also, too few iterations. You know, a thousand iterations or rounds may not be enough. Also, poorly implemented salts and the transferable state attack, which transfers the state of the hash from one iteration to the next decreasing the overall time it takes to unravel the key. But mainly you really want to, you want to have a good salt connected to your password if that's what you're doing. And you want to use something higher than SHA-1. You know, you want 256-bit or higher when it comes to uh, hashing. 
Okay, let's briefly describe uh, key stretching and salting working together. Now, quite often they'll be used in conjunction with a password. So here we have P for password. And the password is this. These four numbers, 7465, 7374. That's in hexadecimal, and those relate to ASCII characters. And if you look at it, it's just this. That's not a very good password. And to be honest with you, if you have... You know, any system should have a policy in place that states that a user, you know, has to have a password with X amount of characters, you know, more than four, uh, and complexity requirements. But this is just a basic example. And whatever the password is, we can make it more secure by adding assaults. And so here I've added eight bytes of data. And what we do is we just add that on to the password. So it becomes the password and the salt. And then what we do is we hash that. And so here we have the first hash iteration. Now in this case, instead of SHA, we're using MD5, which is a possibility. Uh, this is just an example though. So we're taking that password plus the salt and we're hashing that with MD5 and this is our result right here. Then we pass that on and hash that again. That's an iteration and or a round. And we get this and we do it again. And you can see what's happening here. Every time we're taking the previous hash and we're hashing that guy. And in this case, we're doing it a thousand times. And we get our final guy. The 999th hash was hashed a thousandth time to get our final cryptographic hash, which is this. So I just generated these with an MD5 generator, but you know this would be done within the system. And you can specify you know, what hashing function you're going to use and how many rounds you're going to do. A thousand is probably not going to be enough in just about any system. But even this is pretty powerful. Uh, if you can reverse engineer this last iteration, then you've probably got a pretty powerful computer. You might even be able to mine for bitcoins. I don't know. So the idea here is that you're trying to do enough rounds, possibly 10,000, and you're trying to make it tough enough so the attacker has a hard time with their equipment to you know, break the password. And again, you can make that tougher by incorporating password policies. So this is just a basic example of the theory behind key stretching and salting. Now let's go ahead and show this with a Linux computer and actually show it in action. Okay, and this is my uh, Linux Ubuntu computer. This is 14.04, and I have the terminal open right now. And so what I want to use is pbkdf2. That's the password-based key derivation function version 2. And the first thing you need to do is install it. And we do that with the uh, apt-get install. And I'll use Python. So we'll do sudo uh, apt-get space install. And it's going to be python-pbkdf2. And press enter. And type in our password. Okay, and it tells me here it's already at the uh, newest version. I've already installed it, but otherwise the install is fairly simple. If you have a relatively new version of Linux, it'll grab that and do the installation, then you'll have PBK DF2 installed. So that's done. But what I want to do is password protect something, but I want to have an encrypted password. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to password protect the Grub bootloader on this Linux system. And to do that, we'll type grub dash MK password. That's MK P A S S W D. And we'll use PBK DF2. Okay. And press enter. And it says, what do you want the password to be? Now, again, you know, we don't want to type in something like test, but whatever we type in will now be enhanced and salted. So I'll type in a password here and press enter, re-enter it. And it hashes that guy utilizing pbkdf2. 
And so here we go. What is happening here? Well, by default, this PBK DF2 uses SHA-512. And we said you want to use 256 or higher. This is using SHA-512, so even better. And it does 10,000 rounds. And it did it fairly quickly on this system. This is actually a laptop that I'm connected to. It's just a Core i5 laptop, not really that powerful. But uh, did this fairly quickly, and you get the final hash here. So that's a pretty big cryptographic hash. If you can crack this, then you you really you need a supercomputer to crash to crack this. Uh, something very powerful, something with some powerful hardware. And to be honest with you, um, <clears throat> unless you're wailing, unless you're trying to crack the password of a, a CEO or other executive, then all that hardware, as an attacker, all that hardware would be, uh, you could make better use of that doing something else. As I mentioned, mining for Bitcoins or who knows what. But anyways, the idea here is to make it tough enough for the average attacker to not be able to uh, crack the password. So we got this big hash here. And it was 10,000 rounds using SHA-512 as the cryptographic hash. So that is the example with PBKDF2. And uh, a lot of people like PBKDF2 to uh, encrypt passwords and hash them because it's because of the amount of computational power used. Uh, some organizations will use bcrypt but bcrypt has a habit of running slower with this type of thing. Uh, PBKDF2 can use a powerful hash, a good amount of rounds, but uh, do it fairly quickly. Now, you have to be careful with this because if you have a system where maybe you know hundreds of people are picking passwords or resetting passwords every day, well, that could really tax the system if it's a server. So you have to be careful with this. Now, you may say, okay, my company requires that we have you use more rounds. We need to do a million rounds. Well, then you need to make sure that your server is powerful enough that it has the CPU power, CPU slash GPU power to do those rounds and to create that final hash. So that's something you have to test. But you could change this within PBK DF2. You could change the amount of rounds. You could also change the uh, hash used. So that's something to think about. You've got to balance it out. You know, how much power does your server have? How many people are going to be changing passwords uh, or creating new passwords? And, you know, how much are you willing to spend on that server? How much time, how much money are you looking to spend on the server as far as hardware goes? And how much time are you uh, willing to allow that server to utilize for each password change, for each hash of the password? and balance that against who you think might attack the system and how much power they might have. Okay, so finally, I'll just show a quick scenario uh, where this might be used. A security engineer might advise a software project manager to do the following to increase the security of a particular application, especially where passwords are concerned. One, slow down the runtime of a hashing algorithm, increasing the entropy. And we might do that by adding noise, uh, you know, pick up noise from keyboards and mice or whatever. And two, pass the input and the salt back during each iteration or each round. And effectively, that security engineer is describing the technique known as key stretching and salting as well. So that's a scenario where that might be used. So there's a little bit about key stretching and salting. Uh, that's the end of this video. Uh, I'm Dave Prouse, and you can check out all my videos and all that good stuff on my website at www.davidlprouse.com.